Um, so I'm the Sustainable Finance Editor at Bloomberg News. Um, we have a great panel here. We have Anders from MP Pension. We have Megan from Carlyle Group. And we have Huja from Generation Investment Management. Um, and what we're going to talk about is how you can marry ESG with strong financial returns. When I started covering this space about four years ago here at Bloomberg, everybody thought it was a niche market. But it's grown quite a lot. There's about $31 trillion in assets globally that have some kind of sustainable ESG criteria attached to them. Our chart here today is showing that sustainable debt, that's specifically green bonds, sustainability linked loans, just hit a trillion dollars last month cumulatively, so it's actually growing into a real market. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities, there's a lot of risks. Um, I guess when people talk about ESG, you always hear a lot about the risks, but we're going to talk a lot about the opportunities today. So why don't we start talking about the pipeline in private markets um, and how you're seeing that. We'll start with you, Meg. Great. Well, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Meg. I, I work at the Carlyle Group. I'm a global private investment firm, and I'm the head of impact there. And when Danny kicked off this event, she put up um, <clears throat> a poll and asked people to rank what topic they were most excited about. I, I'll pretend not to be insulted, but I think growth equity had 50% plus, and I think the ESG and impact investing panel had around 11%. That, that is the risk, and that is the opportunity. Because I think there's so many misconceptions around any of these words, ESG, impact, SRI. You know, people hear them, and they think that people wearing Birkenstocks and dancing around a campfire and trying to learn investing. But when I think about where the world is going, you can take impact out of the equation. I think growth equity. And so you think about some of these macro trends, the global energy transformation, the electrification of the vehicle fleet, how we drive better health care outcomes at a lower cost, how we get disadvantaged populations access to credit markets. Those are all actually really interesting growth markets, where if you're locking up capital for 10 plus years, I'd rather double down on where the world is going as opposed to where it's been. So I think one of the biggest risks and opportunities in this space is the fact that it could quickly become kind of a marketing or a compliance function, you know, checking the box, yes, we have an ESG policy, yes, we disclose it. The real opportunity is in saying where are there really interesting areas of growth because the world is changing and profitability is converging with impact in a lot of really interesting markets. Yeah, we definitely see in a lot of spaces that the sustainability companies are growing at a faster rate than you know what you'd consider non-sustainable companies, if that's still a thing anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Anders, tell us, you know, what do you think about private <coughs> markets and where's, where's the pipeline that you're seeing? Uh, well, thank you. Um, but my name is Anders Schilder. I'm the C Chief Investment Officer at MP Pension, and uh, we are sort of a mid-sized Danish pension fund. And for us, uh, responsible investment is very much at the heart of what we do. It's very, very high in the agenda for us. So it's something that we look at in every asset classes that we invest in, also in the, the unlisted space. Um, I actually, I honestly, I used to think that this thing about ESG and responsible investment was something that you know was all, only about listed equity. Then I learned that, OK, it's also about fixed income. And over the last couple of years, I learned that uh, it's also very much about the unlisted space. And I think this is something that uh, we and many other investors, uh, asset owners, are going to work much more thoroughly in the years to come. Uh, specifically, with regard to the pipeline, um, we, we, you, know, we, you can do all sorts of impact investments, but you cannot, you know, we 16 billion euros in our, at our fund, and we cannot save the world. So you have to, you know, have to focus and have to find out where you want to make a difference. And, and guess what? I think the big, biggest challenge we have as, as mankind is the climate crisis, the green transition that we are facing. And I think that's also the greatest opportunity from an investment point of view. So what we decided is to put 5% of the fund aside, uh, at least the, uh, the board have decided, and we are very much behind it at, at the fund. Uh, that, and and that's, that's where we have our focus uh, when it comes to impact investing and and really where, where we need to start building our pipeline. And if I could just finish off, one extra area I come to think of is um, energy efficiency in real estate. I think that's going to be very, very big also. That's yeah, the I think we'll come, we'll come back to that for yeah. sure. Um, Pooja, yeah, tell us a little bit about your approach at Generation and how you guys see the pipeline and sustainable opportunities. Sure, thanks, Emily. Um, so I'm a partner in our investment team at Generation. We're a long-term oriented investment fund. We invest both in the public and private markets. Um, and really for us, using sustainability and ESG, it, it's a tool for us to really identify long-term oriented, durable businesses. Um, and I think the important thing is it's, it's, not in re, you know, it's not replacing a rigorous, traditional 
financial framework for making investments. It's really complementing that. And so we take that framework and then we really think about um, essentially what does a business do and how is it doing it and how does that align with what we think is inevitable, which is a no carbon, healthy, fair, prosperous society. And that is just another way for us to really identify great businesses that we want to back for the, you know, many, many years. Great. So impact investing, you talked about a little bit, Anders, and everybody's talked a little bit about that. It started out sort of um, really the domain of venture capital spaces, right? And you could say, here's a business where I can really have an impact if I invest in it. Um, the Global Impact Investing Network just sort of tried to size the market, and they said it's 502 billion. But when you look at the overall size of the market, you know, and the opportunity, you probably need about five trillion to seven trillion of investment to meet the sustainable development goals. So th there's a ways to go there. Um, so what's interesting about Carlisle and firms like that entering the space is there's some scale being brought to this. So could you tell us about like what's it look like when you think about impact investing at scale? Yeah. I think one of the challenges in the impact space is that it does have a reputation of being really niche, really early stage, small, funky deals. And I think you know the market has defined impact investing pretty narrowly as private market investments into companies whose core business models are solving an environmental or social challenge. And I think what's been interesting in the last few years is if you focus on just pure play businesses, that will forever be a small portion of the investable universe. So how do you think more broadly about impact as change over time and this delta? How do you take companies from where they are and prepare them for the future? And so one quick example, um, in 2015, Carlisle acquired a company called Axel Tech. Um, about a 100-year-old conventional manufacturing business. It manufactured powertrains for heavy-duty commercial and defense vehicles. Classic impact investment. Um, but at a board meeting about two years into the investment, when uh, the chairman mentioned that one of their clients had asked them to prototype an electric powertrain. A lot of municipalities are electrifying their bus fleets. There's just been a big demand as we have to see this shift. That could have been a passing comment. But Rodney Cohen, who leads the fund at Carlisle, who invested in that, seized on that moment as a potential growth opportunity. Um, we ended up, it took about $20 million of capital to invest in designing, prototyping, and manufacturing this electric powertrain. But man, that ended up being the growth driver for that company. Um, so about a year ago, we ended up selling the electric vehicles unit for a 6x on that capital invested. You know, that's a very good example of that wasn't about altruism. That was taking a conventional company, seeing where their market was going, and investing and meeting that. So I think the, the concept of impact, if we keep it in this very narrow niche area, we're ignoring the kind of broad applicability across an investment universe where it can really help drive economic value. Yeah, it's interesting with transportation because I think when a lot of people think about this space, you think about renewables and investing in climate stuff. But transportation is, at least in the U.S., the largest source of emissions now. And you guys had a deal today announced, right? Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Um, yeah, we just we announced this morning. So our growth, our growth equity fund um, co-led a Series D investment in a company called Convoy, which is a digital freight. Um, platform, which um, basically means they're using digital and AI to better match up shipments with trucks. Um, and exactly like you said, trucking, you know, not typically what you think of when you think about sustainable investing, people usually automatically go to windmills or solar farms. But as you said, transport a huge source of emissions, particularly in the US. And actually what this business is doing is, you know, not only is it doing kind of traditional things good businesses do, like providing a better customer value proposition to shippers, um, and also providing a great livelihood and a good experience for truckers, but it's actually taking loads of empty miles off the road. And actually a surprising you know, number of trucks basically are running around with nothing in them, spewing fumes unnecessarily. And basically through technology, these, you know, we think this business is really improving that equation. And so this is exactly the kind of thing I think that illustrates that um, you know, sustainable investing and impact investing, which you know, again are terms that sometimes get conflated but are, can be a little bit different, it's really applicable across sectors. And you know, we've shown that it's applicable across public and private as well. So this is just as relevant for large, you know, medium or large cap um, publicly listed businesses. Yeah, and this company, Convoy, is only about a four-year-old company, so it was interesting to see it have a $2.75 billion valuation today on that round. So um, there is quite a lot of opportunity that people are seeing, and sometimes they develop very quickly in this space as you see new technologies emerge. Um, where you, you guys have looked sort of more broadly under is at your climate portfolio, and you've divested from some energy companies. Um, you know, you have like, you touch a lot of different parts of the market. Um, 
when you think about investing at a scale that matches the climate crisis, how are you guys approaching that? Well, first of all, we took the decision that uh, our investment strategy should be compatible with the goals of the Paris Agreement. So that was a quite easy decision to make. It, you know, it sounded good, easy to make. And then the hard part, part was then, you know, we had to ask ourselves what to do then. And that led us in different direction. And it, I'm just, you know, I was just thinking before, you know, you, you can make impact investment, investments or you can make an impact. Mm -hmm. And that's what we try to do with our total portfolio of investments. So we try to do an impact in the green space uh, where we allocated these 5%, as we just discussed, because we see enormous, very good investment opportunities there and there's an enormous need for capital. Then we divested our fossil fuel investments, uh, Chevron, Exxon, Mobile, Total, uh, what have you, Equinor. Uh, and the, the main argument there was actually that we, we feel that, that these investments long-term for us, being a long-term investment, will, investor will be quite poor investments, or this, there's a high risk that will be poor investments. But we also feel that we can do an impact, because if we do so, and many other investors, and increasingly so, they do, they do come to that conclusion uh, that the returns will be poor, we can make an impact by raising the cost of capital for these companies. But then finally, I would say where we can make the biggest impact is probably with the rest of the portfolio. Because here we're talking about 5% aside, selling 2% off, we still have 93% of the portfolio invested in all sorts of regular companies. And there we can make an impact by trying to engage with companies. We've done so, for instance, with Maersk being the biggest shipping company in the world. And I, I hope and I feel that maybe we have a little bit of a little bit about a part to play in their recent uh, ambition to become carbon neutral already by 2050. So there's a lot of things we can do to make an impact. Great. Um, well, we have a poll for the audience, so maybe we can go to that poll um, if you guys have your polling apps out. Um, we wanted to know, sustainable investing is not just about climate. What ESG factor do you think is most likely to drive returns? And the options are energy efficiency, diversity, <coughs> safety, employee turnover. So we're really curious to see what you guys have to say about that. But um, while you're thinking about that, I'll try and have the panel answer some of these questions themselves. Um, what do you think drives returns? And we'll start with, with you, Meg. Awesome. Um, so I, I think one of, one of the risks I talk about a lot in this space is the idea of the checklistification of ESG and impact. And this idea of when people talk about ESG data, a lot of times they're talking about ESG scores, which isn't necessarily data. And so we all want better data about what companies are actually doing, what their diversity actually looks like, what their energy efficiency actually looks like. But the challenge is a lot of the times the scores that you see around companies are about these binary indicators. Yes, no, a company has a diversity policy, and yes, no, they disclose it. It's not about the actual makeup of their workforce. Do you want to be investing around if a company has a policy or not, or do you want to be investing around if they actually have a diverse workforce? Um, there was a neat piece of research that came out about two years ago that showed companies that had more ESG policies and disclosures actually financially underperformed peers by about 380 basis points on an annualized basis. And the only alpha signals were when you could find quantifiable ESG data. And so actually the strongest alpha correlate that this team found was diversity as measured by number of women in your workforce. And that was correlated with about 330 basis points of outperformance on an annualized basis. That's why almost half of our money is run by women at Carlisle. <laughs> but I think the headline there is the policies and disclosures aren't what matters. It's the actual underlying data. And so I do think there's alpha in all of these different signals, but you have to be able to parse through and, and find that. Yeah, it's really interesting looking at the poll results here because um, most people say energy efficiency, diversity got a really high um, percentage. But actually, safety is so interesting because that is one of the areas ESG investors have focused on for a very long time. Um, you think about like the BP <coughs> Deep Horizon spill. Um, you think about even Boeing this past year with the airline incidents. And safety can be one of the biggest drivers of stock impact. Um, and employee turnover, a lot of people talk about as a good factor in the ESG space. So, um, Pooja, I'd love to hear what you think drives returns and how people are deciding what's what's material and what to focus on yeah I think um, I think for me a really uh, a point that doesn't get made strongly enough maybe in the mainstream kind of financial community is materiality um, so I think it's really hard to say that there's you know one factor or another factor that's going to really drive ESG returns or ESG related returns because I think what we found 
and we're 15 years into this journey, is that the key is to really identify what is the small set of material factors related to ESG or sustainability that's really relevant for the business and for the industry. Um, and then really focus a lot of time and energy on what good looks like there and how's your company performing relative to peers and are they continuing to outperform on those metrics. And so again, when you think about the, you know, the wind farms or the solar farms, um, people automatically, for example, will go towards carbon emissions. And carbon emissions may be one of the material factors if you are in the energy production space, but it's probably not the material factor if you are in um, the healthcare space. And actually, what you really want to think about there is patient outcomes and maybe sales mechanisms and you know a variety of other factors. And so, um, I think the I think the message actually I would I would pass on to those who are interested in getting involved in sustainable investing is that just like there's not a single financial metric that's going to create alpha for you, an ESG score is not going to create alpha for you. And so it's about doing the work on you know what is differentiated about your thesis, just like you do with financial metrics. Um, and that materiality is what's going to drive returns. Yeah, Anders, how have you been changing your strategy to focus on you know one factor or another that you think is driving returns? I think we, we focus on all the factors, so to speak. Um, uh, every company uh, is a has its issues, so to speak, and it's a complex thing. So it, it, I think it's difficult just to, to you know say that you know, whatever factor is the most important because. Uh, um, it's really difficult to make that uh, judgment, but I have no doubt that companies that are run in a sustainable manner in the long run will also deliver superior returns. I mean, we, sometimes we forget uh, these, what ESG actually is. I mean, mm -hmm. we just say ESG, but think about it. It's environment, it's social, it's governance. So go companies with good governance, proper governance structures, who are in sync with society around them, uh, who don't do you know, money laundering that ruins their brand, Think companies that are conscious of the environment that they are operating in and the, that they have to stay there for long term, have a proper business. You know, to me, it's obvious that they will be delivering the best returns over the long term. Yeah, I hear that a lot in the space that if you get the governance right, the E and the S will sort of follow. So well, let's move on to the energy transition a little bit because as you, the panel said, this is sort of one of the biggest opportunities out there. Um, we have this great chart from Bloomberg New Energy Finance which shows sort of the scale of the energy transition that's occurring. Um, we're sort of over here today where renewables are about 25% of power in some markets, but by 2050, they should be powering half the globe at least. Um, and it's moving potentially even faster than this. So um, then also, if you look in the company scale, we have another chart. It's coming up. So this shows companies that have set science-based targets and how much emission reduction they have to create by 2030 to meet those targets along the pathway to the Paris Agreement. And you can see that you know it starts off kind of slow and easy, and then you have to make some really, really difficult choices. Um, and some sectors obviously have more work to do than others. So that goes back to this materiality thing we were talking about. So what I wanted to ask this panel is how do you see climate change and climate risk and sort of this, this pathway starting to affect asset prices? Um, let's start with Meg on wind farms. Yeah. Um, well, maybe I'll take it a little bit more broadly, but I think um, climate change is clearly a massive pressing issue. And one of the challenges for investors is that we have all variety of projections and models showing us that the world is going to look vastly different in 50 years, but it gives us a wide range of potential outcomes. So we know the world is going to change drastically, but we don't know where, when, and how that will affect asset prices. And so the challenge is, how do you position a portfolio for massive change by making tactical decisions that still make sense today, given your fiduciary duty, given the return hurdles that you need to meet? Um, so I, I tend to think about it conceptually across a portfolio. I almost imagine a normal distribution curve, kind of the barrier under the curve being the value of your portfolio. Some portion of your portfolio will have significant left tail risk. And that is the you know, big drawdown as the energy you know, transition happens. That could be from things like stranded assets, could be technologies that are made obsolete, could be assets that are in geographies that are really impacted by weather-related events. But the question being, can you accurately assess and make some tactical shifts to cut off that left tail risk so you're avoiding the worst drawdowns? 
the bulk of your assets to a lot of the points Pooja's made, you need to steward well through that transition. There'll be some opportunities, there'll be some risks. The material drivers are different for different industries and sectors. So how do you find thoughtful managers who can help integrate that into their investing process? And then the last piece is this right tail upside, where some sectors will have a disproportionate benefit from the energy transition. You know, renewable energy is predicted to go from 7% of the global energy generation mix today to more than 50%. Talk about growth equity, that, that is where I'd put my chips on growth. And so how do you find ways where you know, you're underwriting it to the same standards as you would any other investment, but where you can double down, particularly in private assets, where you're locking up capital for 10 plus years in a lot of instances, how do you double down on getting outsized exposure to that right tail risk, but in a way that still makes sense for your asset allocation today? Yeah, it's interesting about private capital. I'm sure actually maybe I'll ask you about this too because I think pension funds are thinking about renewables and from a, a, a different way. They're, they're thinking about, you know, this is a good place to store money. Well, I guess you can, uh, you can see them as a good place to store money as a sort of <laughs> fixed income substitute. But I think what we're facing is a, um, a couple of decades where we will see enormous transition of all of our energy systems and we need all sorts of new innovations and technologies that need to be rolled out at global scale with huge infrastructure investments. What I'm trying to say is there's also a lot of risk out there that you can invest in and huge opportunities that you can invest in. Uh, so um, to me it's, uh, you know, you can, you, 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 whatever you want you can find it out there with the right pro risk profile for you. Yeah, and you have a climate aligned portfolio? Yes, we have a climate aligned portfolio. Um, again. It's still something that we're still developing on. The question is what is climate aligned? Uh, ultimately, you want to be able to measure it. You want to be able to put up targets for yourself. You can work out and then work against those targets. But in order to do that, we need, we need data. And I think that's probably, and you alluded to it before, I think that's going to be the next big thing within ESG data. More and more data, more and more um, raw data from the, directly from the source that you can actually trust, which is not just a binary, um, ticking off at the box uh, kind of thing. Uh, that, that's going to be the next thing. And CCFD, which, uh, which I believe Mr. Bloomberg has been quite involved in also, I think is one of the, going to be one of the catalysts for, for creating that. Yeah, and measuring along, um, assets along that pathway is going to get more important. Um, Pooja, where is the place that you are seeing uh, climate risk affect asset prices? So um, I think we see it, especially you know, if you take a multi-year view, then I think especially we see it you know, coming down the pipeline in a number of places. But I think um, sometimes people, especially when they're talking about sustainability, um, look immediately towards kind of regulation. And they kind of think this is, this is where you, the risk enters the equation. And it's really from a stick versus a carrot. Um, but I think there's a lot of opportunity in, in more the carrot side of the equation. And so we're talking about you know, supply side energy mix, but I think a big topic of conversation is more in demand management, for example. And the reason something like that is interesting, I mean, if I look at like the built environment or buildings, um, of course you have a number of regulatory factors at play and that's you know, affecting asset prices for sure. If you don't have the right kind of equipment or the right kind of services, you know, you're just becoming less competitive. Um, but it's also about delivering great outcomes to the people in the building and lowering their operating costs and providing a better, more productive workspace. And so you don't have to have regulation in order for these things to start affecting prices or opportunity. And again, it's much more the carrot than the stick. And I think that's also you know, an important part of getting ahead of the equation, because typically when regulation comes into effect, it's priced in. Um, you know, and so that's, that's more of a lagging indicator in a lot of cases. And so I think it's looking beyond that and kind of thinking about where are you creating value rather than just kind of avoiding the worst case scenario. All right, so well, let's close out with a lightning round question. Um, at Bloomberg, we think about you know, energy efficiency all the time, but we also think about all these different areas where there could be opportunities in the sustainable economy. Um, so let's name the sector or theme you think is undervalued in sustainable investing that hasn't gotten mainstream attention yet. And we'll start with you, Meg. So I, I mentioned the kind of energy transition, renewables going from 7% of our energy generation to 50%. When you hear that, you think wind, you think solar, you think these big renewable assets. What, what is underneath that is that there is a ton of infrastructure and adjacent businesses that will be needed to facilitate that transition. And so I think things like you know, charging infrastructure, energy as a service, demand management, you know, behind the meter storage, all these adjacent industries that help facilitate that transition, I don't think get the same attention that wind and solar development do, but I think we'll have some pretty interesting upside. Pooja, where's uh, somewhere that we haven't focused on yet? 
Um, I think circular economy is something that people are just really starting to appreciate in the financial sector. Um, but I think that's really about extremely efficient supply chains and thinking about how to use less resources, which is effect effectively lowering your cost. Um, so I think this is something that companies are going to be rewarded more for by the financial community. And Anders, close us out. Where, where do you see the under under-focused opportunities? We think about this as a, uh, in, in terms of relative value as we do within all asset classes. Uh, and when we look at the, the sort of the investment opportunities within the, uh, the green transition, it seems to me and us that you know, the assets where you have these very secure, stable, long-term contracted cash flows, they are quite expensive. They're quite expensive for good reasons because government bond yields are so low. So that's mm -hmm. the obvious alternative. So it's, I would rather point to them as perhaps being, perhaps being a bit overvalued or very overvalued, uh, and hence uh, other investments relative to them being undervalued. Great. Well, thank you to our wonderful panel for this great discussion. And um, it's almost time for drinks. So thank thanks you a lot. Definitely.